Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Stephen Miller, and um, I'm co-presenting with my colleague Shanti Gonzalez. Hi, everybody. Um, if you have anything uh, that you want to say during the presentation, drop it in the chat. Uh, and uh, also, we're going to talk a lot about, about uh, tons of numbers today. So everything uh, is available on uh, the website on your screen, transitapp.com slash real life, if you want to dive into the stats a bit more. Uh, and we, because we just kind of raced through them a little too much. Um, but we'll get going. So uh, like I said, I'm Stephen Miller. I am the communications lead here at the Transit app and uh, presenting with my colleague Shanti Gonzalez, who works on partner communications. So uh, that is mostly with our transit agency partners. Uh, so just to start off really quickly, uh, a bit about us, a bit about transit. Uh, we are a team of 65 uh, based in Montreal. The app is in more than 300 cities worldwide with a strong focus on the US and Canada, uh, but also France, Australia, New Zealand. Uh, it's uh, built around kind of the everyday needs of transit riders. Where is my bus? I can track it on the map. I can get in, you know, ETAs uh, for the nearest transit lines. Uh, and of course, the app has grown and evolved over time. We now include fare payment, on-demand microtransit, bike share, scooter, car share. Um, one could call this mobility as a service. Um, I myself am not a buzzword fan. Um, and that's a whole different presentation for a whole different day. Um, uh, we offer a subscription service called Royale where uh, users can purchase a subscription directly, which gives them additional features in the app or transit agencies uh, can purchase subscriptions for their entire ridership uh, and have transit kind of be their app for all of their riders. Uh, fundamentally though, right? Like the app is built on this base of um, high quality, um, you know, data standards, uh, GTFS for transit information and schedule information, GTFS real time to add the real time component, GBFS for bike share, scooters, car share, GOFS, which is under development for um, uh, on demand services like micro transit, uh, and uh, whatever, whatever comes next. So with that kind of overview of transit and where we kind of fit in the space, I'm gonna hand it over to Shanti to get into the meat of what we're gonna talk about. Yes, so the meat. What we are talking about today is communications and more specifically, how transit agencies communicate with riders. Uh, what we're hoping that we'll learn by the end is which communications channels specifically go the furthest and which fall short. Uh, and the idea is maybe we can use this numbers driven approach to focus our communication strategy moving forward. The stars of the show today are going to be public meetings. How inequitable are they really? We'll talk about social media and we'll even talk about by platform, how, how they're doing with people. Uh, we'll talk about in system signage and how it never goes out of style, especially when you have the right typography as per Mark's presentation earlier today. And we'll talk about information by phone, more than just apps, but also, yes, apps, but more than just apps, of course. Um, so yeah, we'll go to the next slide. So um, it's important to know like where the numbers we're gonna be talking about come from. Like we don't invent them out of thin air, as fun as that might be. Uh, uh, every quarter at Transit, we run a survey um, with the transit agency partners who uh, subscribe to the survey. Uh, we run it across the US and Canada and it asks a whole bunch of different questions about um, transit service, how riders create their agency, what their experiences have been riding transit. Um, the latest edition is actually up in the app now, uh, so you can fill it out if you would like. Um, but the numbers that we're going to be looking at today came from our October 2021 survey, the most recent one. Um, and so um, it ran from late October to early, very early November 2021. Uh, the survey ran in English, Spanish, and French in the US and Canada, but today we are only going to be looking at US statistics. Uh, and that is across all languages that the survey was completed in. So um, I want to address our user demographics uh, head on up front because it's a good question people often bring up, uh, which is to say, how generalizable are these survey results, right? Um, the universe of transit app users is not the same as 
the universe of transit riders overall, and that is true. Um, but uh, the, you know, the assumption that like apps are for tech bros uh, is not true anymore, right? So um, mobile phone adoption, uh, especially smartphone adoption uh, in the US is really high, uh, even among low income groups. Uh, the one group where there's lower, significantly lower adoption is among older populations. And that's the case for us as well. Uh, like all apps, there's a lower representation of older users. Um, but, uh, it, you know, it's important to know that, you know, 60% of our writers, you know, are in households earning 60,000 or less. Black and, and uh, Hispanic writers make up uh, a majority of our usership um, uh, right now. So, uh, of course, during the pandemic, the, the shape of who rides transit has changed and uh, our usership uh, demographics have uh, changed along with it. But uh, when it comes to uh, the demographics of transit ridership, uh, the, our usership is either as diverse or uh, in many cases more diverse than that ridership, often because our usership is heavily focused on buses. Uh, and so the, the app is really um, designed for all modes, but um, has a particular strength for bus riders. And so the demographics of bus riders is, is different than let's say a WMATA Metro rail rider or an SF BART rider uh, would be. So um, yeah, I just wanted to um, kind of dive into that, set some context so that way uh, you know how these numbers do and don't apply kind of more broadly. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're looking only at responses in the US uh, from October 2021. So that's 21,000 people uh, across the US. Um, and of course, like I said, you know, this only represents people who answered the survey in the app. Um, but based on you know, the comparisons we make on demographics, we feel pretty confident that uh, it's a, a useful uh, exercise to, to learn more about uh, what riders overall are thinking and how they're using their systems. Shanti. So here's the question that we asked riders and that we're gonna focus on today. We asked, how do you recall receiving information from or communicating with your transit agency? Check all that apply. And two things I would just wanna call out here is, a, check all that apply means that these categories are not discrete. Riders could select every single one that they feel applies to them. And two, we left this question intentionally very broad. Uh, we wanted to get a sense for not just service information or real-time information or outreach, but we really wanted to get at what are the touch points that you have with your transit agency? Next slide, please, Stephen. Thank you. And so overall, this is a chart of our overall responses. So those 21,000 users across the US. I think first things first, it bears mentioning that transit got 80%, which is not really a surprise given that this survey took place in the transit app for transit users. So just wanted to you know, call that out. Uh, the top four, including transit, were signage at 30%, other apps at 14%, and the agency's website at 13%. And then as we move to like the 10% threshold, we have social media at 10% of riders, local media such as TV, radio, websites, and newspapers at 9%, email at 7%, text 5%, phone 5%, and other 5%. And we also have our friend public meetings at 1%, which is something we will get back to in a little bit. Um, the fun part comes, I think, when you start to break down these numbers um, by uh, income levels so, and race. And so let's start with income. Um, there's a lot on this chart, so we'll walk through step by step. We, we did a basically crude division of uh, income, and we said, okay, under 30,000 will classify class, uh, house, under 30,000 annual household income, we'll classify that as a lower income rider. Over 100,000 household annual income, we would classify that as a higher income rider, just to get an understanding of kind of where the two edges uh, are. So, um, for some modes of communication, there is a somewhat equitable distribution. Um, you know, like for example, you look at text message, there's uh, less variation. But for others, you know, there's a, a significant uh, distribution. Um, you know, lower income riders uh, versus higher, higher income riders, for example. Um, and, and we kind of 
highlight those on the right side of this slide here. So up top, it's uh, the uh, modes of communication that are more likely to reach high income riders. And not down below, it's the modes of communication that are, or excuse me, more, more likely to reach low income riders up top and down below more likely to reach high income riders. So for public meetings, as Shanti was mentioning, public meetings, um, you know, three and a half percent of high income riders above $100,000 a year say that in the past six months, they've attended a public meeting for their transit agency, but less than 1% of low income riders say the same thing. And so that's a, you know, a 3.7x differential between the two. Um, social media, uh, you know, 25% uh, of high income riders say they've communicated with their transit agency or gotten information via transit, uh, via social media just 7% of low-income riders say the same thing. It's important to note too, um, signage and, and, at post, and posters at stops, at stations, onboard vehicles uh, is the number two choice uh, for all income groups. Um, and that's, but there's still noticeably kind of an inequity there. Um, you know, half of high-income riders say that they got information from, um, from the signage on the system, whereas you know just a quarter of lower income riders said the same thing. So that's significant and kind of interesting to us. Um, now I want to dive a little bit more into this. So as I mentioned, the stats we're looking at are from our October 2021 survey. The summer before, in uh, August 2021, we asked a slightly different question where we asked people about specific social media channels that they used for transit information. And this is really interesting, um, right? Like higher income riders we found were eight times more likely to use Twitter for transit information or to communicate with their transit agency than lower income riders. Um, you know, whereas Facebook, for example, had a more even split. Um, and phone lines and text messages uh, were two, two of the least popular options for high income riders. Whereas for low income riders, phone lines and text messages were um, selected about as often as you know other non-app options like social media, email, or local media, right? So the reliance on these different modes of communication are different for these groups. Um, and low-income riders were more than 10 times more likely to get information through an app, whether us or any other app, than through public meetings and social media combined. Uh, so the, in terms of meeting riders where they're at, uh, there's a huge variation um, by income level. And now we can kind of also sort it out by race. I'm going to hand over to Shanti for that. Yeah, so if we switch the lens to look at the race and ethnicity breakdown, we see some differences in distribution here compared to the income chart. I think most notably is the mobile apps, transit and other uh, mobile apps, as well as phone lines, are more evenly distributed by race than they were by income. But the consistent pattern overall here is that white and Asian respondents are more likely to report using a wide variety of communications channels, whereas Black and Latino writers use the fewest, and Latinos are almost always the least likely to be reached by a given communications channel. It's also interesting to note that local media, the TV, radio, websites, and newspapers of the world, was the only category more likely to reach Black respondents than other respondents on this survey. Um, so our next slide, we'll zoom in a little bit on the communications channels that had the most disparity in their reach. Um, so public meetings, here we are. We see that they reach white riders more than their Black and Latino counterparts. In this case, four, they're four times 4.4x differential here in the reach for white riders versus Latino riders, but they don't reach that many white riders overall anyway, we are only seeing 2.2% uh, as the top here. And for website, we also see disparity in that it's the second most disparate for Latinos, where the website is 3.8 times more likely to reach white writers than Latino writers. But we also see it as the most disparate channel for Black writers. And again, an interesting sort of uh, thing to note, I guess, is that while it's disparate, it's still one of the website. It's still one of the most used channels by black and Latino writers. And so we see this inequity, but we still see it as a really important way to connect with these writers. And perhaps that's due to the fact that it's, it's less ephemeral. It's a concrete way to share info, but 
that that complication is a really interesting one. And if you have thoughts about that, please drop them into the chat. Um, but I guess overall, what Stephen and I are thinking about as communications professionals who work very closely with our transit agency communications professional friends is about what we can do with this information. Transit agencies are strapped for time. And so a quick hit on Twitter might feel like a good way to check that comms box. But as we see from this data, you may not be reaching the most riders with that strategy. And so also curious for your thoughts on what strategies we could uh, undertake to make sure that certain channels are going where we need them to go. And I'll hand it to Stephen for the next slide. Yeah, so as Shanti was getting into, right? Like it, it matters how um, transit agencies communicate with their riders. Um, and I think it's important to make sure that this discussion is, is a broad one. Um, right, we're from Transit App. We think apps are great, um, but it's not just about uh, apps. It's about signage in the system. It's about making sure that public meetings are not the kind of only way to provide input on a project. Um, and it's it's about um, thinking about that kind of disparate impact before you begin your communications on a uh, strategy. And it's about meeting writers where they are, right? Which is of course on the system, but also whether they're on the system or not, often on their phones, whether that's an app, whether that's you know uh, a text message, whether that's a, a phone line, um, you know, adoption of phones generally is so high, and cell phones, and also including smartphones, it's so high that um, you know these are powerful tools to engage the riders. And as Shanti mentioned earlier, right, we we made this question intentionally really broad and uh, you know it, we didn't ask specifically where did you get real-time service information and we didn't ask you know where did you connect with your agency about outreach on a project although obviously we understand they are different forms of communication but what's interesting to us in this is that there's a huge disparity among different communications channels when it comes to income and race and so if you want to engage those riders outside of the typical avenues for a project. For example, you know, you're doing outreach for a transit expansion project. Uh, you know, do you rely solely on public meetings? You know, do you do in the street outreach? Do you do intercepts? Do you reach people through apps? Do you make sure your customer support phone line is equipped to engage people on this question perhaps? Um, not only do you have to think about those different methods of communicating across those different types of communication, but also adjusting the communication itself so it matches the needs of the writers in that particular form of communication. We had an agency recently that was interested in working with us to uh, because they're working on an alternatives analysis for uh, transit expansion, and they wanted to get information out to writers through the app. Um, but the method that they had was basically a form saying, you know, please provide your thoughts which is not necessarily the greatest way to engage riders who are opening an app for you know quick information about where their service is. So how do you make sure that you know when you're doing this alternatives analysis, you're also communicating in a way that engages people in kind of more uh, in, in different modes of communication that engage a, a more diverse audience. So um, with that, you know we have some time extra. I really want to make sure we, uh, make this bit of a discussion. Uh, it shouldn't just be you throwing in comments and Shanti and I responding, although we will do, we will do some of that. Um, but please, you know, unmute yourself, uh, talk a bit about your experience. Uh, and uh, if, again, like I said at the beginning, if you want to dive into these stats a bit more, transitapp.com slash real life is where we have the full report. Uh, and feel free to, to dive in and share it around. Hopefully it can be helpful.